Psychiatry Residence Journal podcast series. My name is Matthew Edwards, and I'm Deputy Editor of the Residence Journal and a second-year resident in the Adult Psychiatry Residency Program at Stanford University in Palo Alto, California. I'm honored to be joined today by Dr. Darren Richarder for this episode of the Residence Journal podcast series. Dr. Richarder is a clinical professor in the Department of Psychiatry and Behavioral Sciences and Director of the Human Rights and Trauma Mental Health Program, a joint collaboration between the Stanford Honda Center for Human Rights and International Justice, Stanford Medical School, and the Stanford Law School. Dr. Richard is a national and international expert on human rights and trauma. After receiving degrees in psychobiology and philosophy from the University of California at Santa Cruz, Dr. Richard completed his doctorate in medicine at New York Medical College. He completed internship and residency and served as chief resident at Stanford University Hospitals and Clinics. Dr. Richard is on the list of experts for the Extraordinary Chambers in the Courts of Cambodia and for the United Nations International Criminal Court. He is on the Fulbright Specialist roster for his work in international trauma and mental health. He is a senior fellow at the Center for Innovations in Global Health at Stanford University, and he has spearheaded medical student and resident education in community psychiatry and global mental health. Dr. Richarder, thank you for joining us. Thanks very much for having me. I'm honored. Well, I'd like to begin. Um, if you could sort of just tell us briefly about your career, um, how you've come to work at the intersection of human rights, trauma psychiatry, forensic psychiatry, and social justice. Sure. It's a long story. I don't know how long we have for the podcast, um, but I think going into medical school, I was very much interested in doing international work and felt like it was a conflict choice point, whether I would go into psychiatry or go into an area like internal medicine or infectious disease so that I might do more international work. And I felt like choosing psychiatry was really uh, potentially making a choice that would not allow me to do international or intercultural work. And and it turned out that I was just completely wrong when I was looking at that choice point. And in fact, global mental health is a real frontier, you know, as are other specialties in healthcare. But global mental health is a challenge around the world. And there is uh, ample opportunity for people to become involved and become champions of mental wellness. I think you also asked about the human rights component. And uh, in all honesty, when I started thinking about this career, the, the idea of going into a trauma and learning about torture, rape, these, you know, these horrible realities uh, was a turnoff. I, I, I really was not interested. And, you know, it was really through some of the Early work that I did outside of Stanford, where I was working for refugee clinics, working for survivors of torture programs uh, in Santa Clara County, that it, I became a bit more passionate about it. In other words, more passionate about outcomes. Still learning about the, the details of people's trauma is not something I, I love, um, but it's, it is necessary to do the kind of work that I do. So, you know, a lot of different experiences of actually working with people who are survivors, you know, really led to becoming an advocate in that area. And since this is a journal for, you know, residents and medical students, I mean, I think that happens often. You know, you find yourself serving a population and then you become an advocate or champion for their needs, whatever that is. You know, if you're working in psychiatry, you're working with autism, and suddenly, you know, you realize how much advocacy there needs to be there. And if to complete your mission as a physician, I think you almost necessarily jump into that advocacy role in addition to your treating role. The work I was doing, every patient was by definition a victim of crime or human rights violation because I'm working with people from the Center for Survivors of Torture, which is an international crime. And pretty soon you find yourself very passionate about what led them to your clinic. And, you know, is there more that can be done about this? In terms of creating access for them for mental health or in terms of creating some kind of transitional justice for them? Uh, Thank you. That certainly does shed some light on a lot of the work you've done. And your clinical practice um, is still largely based in the community. Do you continue, outside of this international work, work with the same populations, refugee populations, survivors of torture? Yeah, I have one half day per week that's a therapy clinic here at Stanford. And outside of that, everything else that I do is basically working with marginalized, vulnerable populations. And most of that is 
you know, the survivor population. So people who, who have come here as refugees, and almost always that's because they were persecuted in the place that they came from, or tortured, raped, some sort of human rights violation that has occurred. And, you know, they're referred to us um, through the refugee health clinic, and they're also referred to us by human rights attorneys. And so, you know, uh, as you're doing clinical work and teaching residents in a clinical atmosphere, again, you know, one of the things that's very unusual about all the patients that I see it's not necessarily the diagnosis, but it is the fact of how they came to be in front of you. And that fact is always a crime. So you find yourself overlapping the clinical with the legal. And whether you like it or not, you, you, you become a bit of a forensic expert because you know that what you're uh, learning, writing, thinking about is going to end up in court somehow. And hopefully our program has been a bit original about how to do that. Um, but I think everyone who does this kind of work is very familiar with asylum cases and other, you know, sorts of legal processes that need psychiatric evaluation. Thank you for sharing. It certainly sounds like that the program has been quite receptive to the needs of the region, both here and abroad as well. This is certainly a busy and exciting time for the program. Before we focus on some of the work you've been doing in Fiji, mm -hmm. could you give us a feel for, for the range of issues that your group has explored? Sure. Yeah, so, so the, the Human Rights in Trauma Mental Health program is a formal entity now at Stanford. And it is, as you said in the introduction, it's, a, it's a sort of a, a cross-section of the law school, the Human Rights Center, and the Department of Psychiatry. So we have school, law school, medicine, and the undergraduate humanities. And, you know, that came to be because so often when you're, do, you know, when you're working with survivors, you are necessarily working with attorneys. And so I really found there was, a, there was a period of my life that went on for a long time where I found myself surrounded more by colleagues in law than colleagues in medicine. You know, we'd have, you know, we, a lot of doctors have a lot of doctor friends and, you know, you, a bunch of psychiatrists hanging out in your house when you're a psychiatrist. Uh, and I found that I was, you know, having lunch and coffee with human rights attorneys. I, you know, and a lot of my personal friends and colleagues were were in the law, and we would together be making solutions. So for things that were straightforward, like an asylum case where someone is suffering with post-traumatic stress disorder, and that's going to be valuable as evidence in the case, I mean, it's pretty obvious. But I think, you know, some of the attorneys that I was working with who were really thinking beyond individual cases and thinking about transitional justice in general were the catalyst for this program getting underway. So some of the some of the colleagues that I have over in the School of Law, like Beth von Skak, who you, I know you've met, you know, who's really thinking about you know the justice process, the prosecution of the Khmer Rouge in the extraordinary chambers uh, in the in the courts of Cambodia, where she's really not thinking about individuals, she's thinking about a, a population of people that were terrorized and experienced human rights violations, and we wrote a book together. Uh, that came out in 2011, and that was the first sort of stab at us kind of saying, you know, there's there's something here. There's a huge amount of science that we have as physician psychiatrists that law is not necessarily aware of, or the attorneys. And when we wrote that book together, our goal actually was to impress upon the kingdom of Cambodia the dearth of resources and the need for new uh, resources in mental health for all the people that are suffering after after the uh, human rights violations that happened there. And then that book kind of sat there and quite honestly went in front of the Ministry of Health. And, you know, reasonably, I think, the re Ministry of Health's response was, great book, but we don't have the money <laughs> to do what you're saying. We're well aware of what you're uh, advocating for. In fact, we used most of the, most of the chapters were co-written with Cambodian psychiatrists, you know, because we really wanted to have, you know, the local opinion 
in, in addition to an objective outside opinion. But, you know, the Ministry of Health was basically saying it's fantastic but great ideas, you know, now get the United Nations to pay for it and we'd love to see that kind of happen. And at the same time that that happened, the attorneys that were prosecuting the case looked at that and said, you know, this isn't public health data. This is evidence. The outcomes that you're showing to, to advocate for public health is really something that we can use in a court of law to show, you know, damage to a population. So in addition, obviously, to murder and other charges, genocide. We can also show that the survivors did not do well. The survivors uh, had bad mental health outcomes. And we can actually show that statistically, uh, which was very powerful for the court. And you know, that was really our first sort of stab at this new idea of sort of transcending the individual and kind of talking about a population and advocating for them in a court of law. Now, that ultimately the decision in that first case that we that our book was used as um, an exhibit so the decision reflected the concept that people were suffering with mental health uh, problems which is really as far as we know kind of the first time that that was formally written into a decision in the way that this court did and oftentimes they talk about people suffering or that bad things happen but in this instance they actually talked about trauma post-traumatic stress disorder, put in some statistics that were relevant. And I think maybe more importantly, as reparation, $2 million was awarded for the treatment of people with post-traumatic stress disorder from the case. Mm -hmm. And $2 million here in Stanford and Palo Alto, we were just talking, <laughs> won't even get you an apartment. But um, $2 million in Cambodia is a lot of money. In fact, it, it, it was a huge budget boost for some programs to actually get some important work done. So from that moment, though, you know, the attorneys and the mental health folks that were working with them kind of felt like we had something. Like, this is a new idea, and it's powerful, and it can be used in a lot of different contexts. So that was really the, that was really the beginning of the concept. The rest of it, I'm not sure, is it as exciting. It was more just finding the right folks here at Stanford and the right partners in other parts uh, of the world. And if you have the right faculty, the connections to other people is pretty straightforward. And so we pretty rapidly went from this single success you know, to having our tentacles in all kinds of different projects all over the world. It's, it seems like the forensics piece uh, came about sort of as an you know, unanticipated you know, product of you know, your efforts at doing public health work. That's right. Um, so it's, it's really interesting. Right. I mean, and so we kind of did go from individual evaluations to more like an epidemiology, right? right. And in subsequent qu cases that we've done, we've done hybrids of that. We're sort of saying, well, you know, this whole population might have been affected, and here's some statistics that we can point to and look at. But then we actually interviewed five plaintiffs that are actually testifying in the case. And sure enough, you know, we're able to create, you know, basically a forensic report on each of those individuals, and then say in our more global report, these reports, these symptoms are representative of the population at large. And that's very powerful for court because, you know, again, some statistic that says some number or some fraction of people all have post-traumatic stress disorder, it's, a, it's powerful, it's important. But then to actually say, and, and here's a woman uh, who's a witness in this case, and, you know, these are the symptoms that she has to deal with every day and every night, you know, it really puts the humanity into that expert report. And that, that's also been very successful. It's fascinating. You mentioned now, you know, as a result of this work, you or the group has its tentacles and a lot of other projects. Could you sort of talk, you know, give briefly some of those, those, yeah. Some of those talks? Yeah. I, it, in fact, you know, in the last six months, we've added so many that there's there's a, a in our lab meeting, we used to have a, a chalkboard with, I don't know, five topics on it now. Now what we do is we have a, you know, 25 topics and we'll sort of move over to one side of the chalkboard and say these are the hot topics, meaning these are ones that are 
where there's a court decision coming up or where we have to get a report done or an interview done or that kind of thing. And so that's very exciting to see it go from, you know, a you know, limited number of uh, cases to a big, you know, number of cases. But specifically, we look at human rights violations and that's not just torture and that's not just sexual violence. It doesn't, it's not necessarily about a, um, a political conflict. Most of our cases still are, but we have now tackled other topics like solitary confinement in the state of California. We've looked at child rape in Fiji. We looked at water rights and the water solutions in Flint, Michigan, like showing how you know the poison water has led to massive mental health outcomes, uh, and that you know it's very far from the Cambodian genocide. But from the perspective of our lab. It's not that far. I mean, it's a human rights violation resulting in a mental health outcome is basically the mission statement. And I think the thing that's really fascinating about this is, you know, in the beginning of all this work, it was our attorneys reaching out to other folks. You know, they had friends at the International Criminal Court, and they'd say, hey, you should work with us. We might have something valuable for this case that you're working on. And, and in the last few years, it's been attorneys coming to us saying, we heard about the thing you did in the state of California work on um, solitary confinement. And we think that's very much like a case that we have. Would you be interested in blank? In, and then we take it to the lab, uh, the program, and sort of say, what do you guys think? Is this relevant? Is it what we do? Is it what we're good at? Can we do it? There have been a couple that have fallen flat where it's probably a human rights violation, but it's not in the area that we're expert. And then there have been other ones that have pushed us to say, gosh, and you know, I didn't think about that before, but that's a really good idea. We're in. And then I think that you know, one of the most exciting ones is one that you, you know about, and that is we have been invited to participate in the United Nations investigation of um, ISIS in Iraq. And really, we're going to be working with the uh, witness unit to, to help mostly women um, get access to mental health care, make recommendations about how to handle their deposition testimony, and then also you know, provide expert report if that becomes a case. Obviously, the prosecutors think it's going to become a case. It seems like it is likely to become a tribunal. Um, but we're getting invited very early on. That's very exciting because you know, to me, that's... What's happening in Syria and Iraq is one of the big human rights problems in the world today. And again, everyone that's listening to this is interested in mental health. You're, you know, a psychiatrist in training. We already know that. The lawyers know it. But the lawyers don't have the lexicon. They don't have the language or the expertise to be able to speak eloquently and correctly about these issues. That's why... What we're lending them is so much power because it, it is important. They get that it's important, and we know how to articulate it. Thank you, Dr. Richard. Certainly the situation in Iraq, in Cambodia, you know, I position the group very well to sort of opine on a lot of these issues. You currently provide expert testimony to the High Court in Fiji. Um, and your testimony there on sexual violence has led to important changes within the High Court and also the Supreme Court. Could you tell us how that work began, your role in the work, and what you feel are the important outcomes from those cases? Yeah, I, I, I'm glad that you're asking about this case because I think this case is a, an excellent example of how we, we envision the lab working, and then in fact it worked. You know, Sometimes we envision it a certain way and the court doesn't agree with us. Um, but we, we're working with a very talented uh, attorney um, who... We've worked with on other cases internationally, and she took the position of deputy prosecutor in Fiji, mostly with a, an eye toward changing the laws and precedent around child rape in the Republic of Fiji. And um, she knows our work, and so she had a concept for how to use our work to influence, you know, the uh, the court and also to influence outcomes for survivors. So we started out by being invited to write an expert report about outcomes in child sexual violence. Again, you're a psychiatrist in training. Your listeners are 
medical professionals, it's pretty easy for us to be able to say, yeah, you know, raping a child, especially serial rape of a child, is, is going to have a bad mental health outcome, you know. And for, for many of the folks that are in mental health, you probably even articulate that pretty well. And for people that are very familiar with the literature, it's just, it's, it's so many volumes of how bad it is, right? And that's something that the court does not necessarily understand. And let me be really clear, right? Our prosecutors and our judges that we're working with are every bit as smart as all of the doctors that are in, you know, that are working uh, on these cases. It's just that that's not their area of expertise. And so what um, what our partner did with the the office of the prosecutor was basically ask for a expert report for a particularly egregious case that she intended to use as something of a precedent setting case. I won't say the details on this recording because they are very graphic, very disturbing, but it's sort of like a chronic sexual violence scenario uh, that was even egregious for that kind of um, scenario. She asked for an expert report, and so we were able to sort of write a pretty good literature search, literature review, I'm sorry, of um, you know the relevant outcomes in that are known in childhood sexual violence, and then even use as much local data as we were able to get and talk about how that plays into Pacific Islander culture, how that, what kind of outcomes children have when they're um, victims of sexual violence. And then in that case, she actually asked our lab to interview the two now adult survivors of that, that crime. And so in addition to sort of a statistics and epidemiological review, we have this very human element, which is the, you know, the, the, the testimony uh, of these two women, and then our interview, like a forensic report from these women. And we're able to say, yeah, this is pretty much have a predicted outcome. They both had post-traumatic stress disorder, pretty badly, severe symptoms, were, you know, pretty much pan-positive in all the areas that we think about with PTSD. Um, now, the attorney then asked me for uh, expert testimony in addition to expert report. Once she put into that case the expert report, she is then able to use it in other cases that she's arguing because it's it's part of the record, right? And so very strategically, she took that report and put it into a Supreme Court case where the maximum and minimum sentence for child rape was being argued. Meanwhile, she had me testify in this particularly egregious case that we've been talking about in the high court. And again, they, they were very careful to make sure that that testimony was recorded. Because once it's in evidence, then it can be used in other cases. In other words, I don't have to fly to Fiji every time there's a case, which is good and bad, you know, because Fiji is very beautiful. The inside of the court is not, by the way. Uh, I don't want to sound too glamorous. So the outcome ends up being that she's able to use facts, mental health facts, our science, to get a life sentence for this particular perpetrator in the high court. And then also change the sentencing rules for the Supreme Court, right? And so she's sort of bouncing back and forth with the same data and basically educating, you know, the, the, the judges and attorneys. She's educating the legal system on how big of a problem this is by using the science that you and I know. Uh -huh. um, and I think she intends to keep going, going, going until they're actually not only changing precedent and rulings, but actually taking a look at changing law and law enforcement. And then, of course, my my big goal is that when I work with these attorneys, what I also want to see is that in reparations or as a result of this process, that the, the victims get access to treatment. And that's a, that you know that's really the bottom line uh, for us. We're very interested, obviously, in the legal stuff, but people that are suffering, getting resources, is really what was at the root of uh, of uh, our program. Again, that's very um, inspiring work that really intersects you know international justice, mental health, 
human rights, advocacy, and the law in real time. Moving from this work and, you know, your work in Cambodia and at the U.S.-Mexico border, what are the challenges you face doing this work, and, and what do you identify as important goals for the program going forward? The, the biggest challenges for us is that is global politics. I mean, really, honestly, you know, we are trying to use rule of law to advocate for survivors. And, you know, at the same time, there, there are, you know, major powers in the world that don't want to see that happen. Um, one of the reasons why, you know, our project is working with the United Nations investigation of ISIS in Iraq is because they are not allowed to go to Syria. The president of Syria is saying we're, no investigators can cross this border, right? Uh, so again, you know, uh, international politics, sometimes international law gets in the way where we are advocating for the removal of a vulnerable person who's the uh, victim of a human rights violation. We're advocating for them to win asylum or humanitarian parole or some kind of removal visa. And again, they clearly have what we would appreciate as PTSD and they have a mental health need, but the law is not on our side and, and the, you know, the attorneys are not able to, to win a, a removal visa, right? So, I mean, th- that's another that's a challenge. We, we might interview some folks from Syria who have great mental health needs, have great mental health pathology, and what we're ar- advocate, we're basically we're arguing for them to get a visa into the United States or a visa into the European Union, you know, and then we're faced with policies that say, well, we're not taking anybody from Syria, period. And that's a challenge, you know, because our attorneys are American, they're barred in, in America, and that's where they know how to do their legal work, right? And so sure. that that's an example of a uh, of a barrier usually what the solution is is they find a different way the partner for instance with some of the cases that we've seen from we have done interviews with people coming out of Syria who do need removal visas they need to be vetted into a host country and our attorneys will basically partner with european attorneys and use our expert report to help them get a visa into the European Union. So so even if there's a barrier, we try to find a solution. But I'd say most of the barriers are resources and the politics of the day. Unfortunately, not too far from our own limitations and legal work here in the U.S. That's right. Well, and, you know, I mean, I'm talking about the international stuff, but I mean, even, even with our work with solitary confinement, I have been criticized by uh, friends and family. Like, how can you, why are you trying to argue for some felon who committed this terrible crime? You know, and really we're sort of saying, well, th- the issue is that he, that people are being held in the state of California in solitary confinement for 20 years. And many of them have not committed a violent crime. But trying to find compassion for a felon in the United States is hard to do. It's a barrier, right, to getting the work done. People don't want to hear it. Some people don't want to hear it, put it that way. It's a lot easier to plead your case when you're saying, you know, there's this this woman with children and she was raped in Syria. It's a lot more compassion than there's a young man who's a Muslim who came out of Syria and he also was raped there, but he wants to get asylum into the United States. But, you know, 26-year-old guy doesn't sound very good to the White House right now. Thank you for talking about the, the work you've been doing, the, the challenges, the successes. What do you envision going forward for the program? Yeah, that's a, that's a great question. Before this interview, I was kind of telling you I'm happy that you put that on there. When you have no success, envisioning what happens next is kind of easy. <laughs> the answer is nothing. Um, and when you have success and 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 the the thing that you're successful at is what you want to do the the answer is also pretty easy it's let's just keep doing what we're doing um this program is in a real position i think to to break new ground and do some important new things uh we intend to continue some of the work that we're doing but you know one of the things that's come up that we're really excited about is is what we've learned is 
you know, how misunderstood psychiatry psychology is in courts. And one of the things that we're really keen to start looking at is how do we educate courts and also how do we teach our colleagues in law how to collect some of this information on their own. And so one of the, I think, the most exciting things that we're really looking at is rather than us, you know, doing our own surveys or doing our own research or relying on other people's epidemiology, what we really want to start doing is is teaching, creating a method and then teaching uh, our attorney colleagues how to collect the data for themselves or for us. In other words, you know, if if our if our program has we have a critical mass of anywhere from 10 to 20 uh, faculty slash students at any given time. You know, but some of the groups that we're working with have amazing resources, but they don't know how to collect the, the information. And so one of the things that we're really looking to do is in almost each situation that we're working in, if there's a way that we could teach them how to collect straightforward DSM-style information that we can use in our report in 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 their case that's the that's the thing that we're very excited about doing right now so we're thinking about that in a whole bunch of different kinds of modules like very very simple straightforward things you know like a PTSD checklist that kind of thing mm-hmm. anything from that all the way to a very structured and specific tool for evaluating survivors of sexual violence mm-hmm. And so all of these things are on the table. And again, without the successes, they wouldn't be on the table. Now that we're at the stage of development that we're at, that's kind of what I see as the sort of like the two and five year plan is can we can we coach our colleagues on how to start collecting this data and making it part of the cases? In other words, as they're standardizing how to prosecute in a tribunal, can we influence them so that mental health automatically folds into their chart or their mission of what the tribunal would be? And if we can, can we get you know, the tribunals to start collecting the data that we can interpret for them? Then, then you know, the limit is not with how much, you know, whatever person power we have. The limit is how much resource they have. We can teach them how to do it. Wow. We can get a lot of information. Indeed. indeed. To borrow from your phrase a bit earlier, you're looking, you know, for champions of of human rights. Um, I know other trainees listening, whether they're medical students, residents, fellows, or even junior faculty, are probably asking, you know, whether they have the bandwidth to make similar contributions to global mental health and international justice. Um, What advice do you have for others looking to pursue this line of work in the future? It depends on what you're passionate about, and it depends on what you you know, want to uh, get involved in. I feel like the work that we're doing is very much sort of frontier. It's a lot of pioneering, and I cannot describe for somebody else the path that, that I was lucky enough to follow, right? And, um, and it, it, you know, if, if there's Stanford students listening, you know, of course, come join my lab is my <laughs> advice to you. But um, if there's people out there that have, feel like the, passionate about some of these ideas, but not sure how to fit it into their life. I think definitely during your medical school years and your residency years, just learning more about it, seeking opportunities where you can um, be involved with, you know, cross-cultural cases, uh, human rights cases, if that's possible. You know, and some of the some of the universities are connected to centers for refugees and survivors of torture. If that's something that you're interested in, and and the place where you're doing your residency has that as a possibility, I mean, get involved. Well, thank you, Dr. Richard. Um, Thank you again for taking time out of your busy schedule to talk to us um, about the work you're doing and to our listeners um, for supporting this podcast series as well. Well, thank you for having me on. It's been great. 